Good morning and welcome to St Mary's on this, the third Sunday after Trinity. Wanted to film the service this morning in one of my favourite parts of our beautiful 900 year old church. I'm up in the chancel and behind me is one of the memorials on the wall. It's the Baskerfield uh, Monument. We've heard a lot in the news in the last week or two about how we remember people from the past, statues and windows and memorials, uh, how we remember them for their good deeds and their checkered past. And I wanted to uh, film here because this is one of the most beautiful monuments, uh, beautiful words. It's uh, in, given in loving memory of Thomas Baskerfield, who died on the 10th of October 1799, aged 81, and his wife Isabella, who died shortly afterwards, 8th of February 1800, aged 85. And it was uh, paid for and uh, put up by their son, uh, Thomas. And the wording, which you probably can't make out, I'll read for you. For near half a century they showed unremitted attention to every domestic and conjugal virtue, pious, humble, benevolent and sincere. They fulfilled the duties of humanity and their hearts were warm with all its best affections. The divine precept of doing as they wished others to do to them was the motive of their actions and the guide of their lives. For with grateful hearts they adored and worshipped their Creator and Redeemer, and with a cheerful mind they showed goodwill to man. In short, they strove to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with their God. Such they lived, and such they died, calm and resigned to the dispensation of heaven, they left the world as entering into sleep, without a greater struggle or a greater groan. To cherish the dear remembrance of that worth he honoured living and laments in death their only surviving son, who weeps but for himself and not for them, dedicates this monument to the memory of the best of parents and the best of friends. If, reader, you impress their characters on your mind and follow such examples, like them, you will be respected while living and your memory revered when dead. Such beautiful words that I'm very fond of. And so we come into this holy place, a place of memory and remembrance. And we offer this time in memory and in the loving presence of Almighty God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments, and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. 
For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have broken the tyranny of sin and have sent the Spirit of your Son into our hearts, whereby we call you Father. Give us grace to dedicate our freedom to your service, that we and all creation may be brought to the glorious liberty of the children of God. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We're going to listen now to our first reading, read for us by Sam. A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. The prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Ananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so, and may the Lord fulfill words that you have prophesied, and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. But listen now to this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. This is the word of the Lord.
Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus said to the twelve, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of the least of these little ones in the name of a disciple Truly, I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Twenty years ago, almost to the day, I walked through the gates here. I was beginning a short retreat, and at the end of that retreat, I would be taken by bus to St Paul's Cathedral in London and be ordained as deacon. Little did I know that years later, I'd be living just a few miles up the road from here. And so this weekend marks the 20th anniversary of my ordination. And that might have been something where we uh, marked that in some way at St Mary's. Uh, we might have had what we like to refer to as enhanced refreshments. But I'd have wanted to be a little bit careful about how we marked this anniversary and celebration because I think sometimes the anniversary of ordinations can feel very... Uh, egocentric and uh, rather sort of self-important. Uh, there's so much that I would want to give thanks for and do give thanks for, uh, but I'd want it to be a collective celebration, rejoicing in the ways that I've been able to serve God and God's church through these years and those I've been able to minister alongside. So I've come here to All Saints Centre. This is in London Colney. Uh, an amazing uh, place. I uh, have very uh, vivid memories of that retreat 20 years ago and especially the chapel, the Ninian Compa Chapel, where we heard some uh, wonderful addresses given by Mark Oakley who was leading our ordination retreat. Sadly no longer in uh, use today uh, and being developed for housing, the chapel stands here. Uh, I guess its future as yet unknown. And as I reflect on those years of uh, ministry, I want to encourage us all to think about our ministry and how we go about discerning how God might use us for good in his service. And as we do that discernment, I've come back here to St Mary's, partly so that I don't have to do battle with the bird song and traffic noise and uh, background sounds but also because I wanted to be here at the font. Our baptism is always the starting point for any ministry. A previous Pope was interviewed on the day he was consecrated as uh, elected as pontiff. And the journalist suggested to him that this must be the most important day of his life. And the Pope corrected him and said, no, absolutely not. The most important day was the day of my baptism. And in similar fashion, the current Pope has suggested that the two most important days of our life are the day we're born and the day that we discover why. Our baptism puts us in a covenant relationship with God as brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, who is our saviour and the pioneer of our discipleship, offering by his example and by his teaching the pattern for our own living and ministry. 
but baptism offers us no insulation from the wrangling and struggles that face us in everyday life and engaged Christian living. Just the means with which to do that struggling and discerning rather better than we would on our own. Take the Old Testament reading read for us this morning by Sam. I normally like to preach on the gospel, but I think our reading from Jeremiah this morning is helpful in what I want to say. The passage describes a sort of a showdown between prophets, the prophet Hananiah and the prophet Jeremiah. It's a moment of crisis. The people are on something of a, a, a cliff edge, as it were. King Zedekiah is contemplating revolt against the mighty Babylonians. And he hears two messages from the prophets, one from Hananiah, a popular message. Stand up to them. The reign of the Babylonians is almost over and God is on our side and we will prevail. Well, who wouldn't want to see the exiles return? Who wouldn't want to see the temple reestablished? Who wouldn't want to see the uh, rule over the people uh, lifted from them? And Jeremiah says, perhaps slightly sarcastically, well, I hope Hananiah's right. Time will tell. But he knows in his heart that actually the true message is to stay put and submit to the Babylonians if they want to live. He, like everyone, would rather that it was different. But God's grace calls us to be faithful, not just to live easy lives. For Jeremiah, as so often in any ministry, integrity calls us to stand alongside people and be bearers and hearers of sad news, of, of tough decisions, an unwelcome diagnosis or a crushing and painful bereavement. His message still rings true. Be, beware of easy answers and simple solutions. Beware of resting on God's grace as if somehow we own it or can control it. Discerning the truth is not an easy matter, especially since we are so prone to be influenced by what we already want or we, what we think will serve our interests best. What is necessary is a careful analysis by God. Real discernment begins not with a debate and panel discussions and committee meetings, although it's good to reflect together sometimes to work things through. It won't be helped by a working party or reading another book. Discernment begins on our knees, perhaps even prostrate on the floor. Discernment begins from the position of humility, because it's all too easy for us to assume that our certainty is born of God and that those who disagree with us are most certainly not of God. I would say that the kind of wrestling and discerning and holding before God in prayer, that kind of thing has been a hallmark of my 20 years of ministry and I hope has been the better for it. There've been many times when I felt very uncertain about what to do. There've certainly been times when I've been serving God's church when I've said things and I really wish I hadn't now. And indeed, occasionally times when I should have said something and didn't speak up and things that I might have done very differently. And if you've been on the end of any of those things, then I'm really sorry. But I've also been hugely blessed to be alongside people in all of those places where I've served, who've been willing to accept my ministry, warts and all, with some gifts, but frailties and shortcomings as well. And it's been a great joy and privilege to share in that ministry alongside the ministry of others. As I said at the beginning, ministry is never about the ministry of one person. It's perhaps just a coincidence, but in all three places where I've served, there's been a church dedicated in honour of Mary. And I think that in many ways, Mary can be for us a role model and an inspiration in our ministry, whatever it looks like. She offers to us an example of humble and yet willing service, something about against our own certainty and purpose and will. The way in which she prayerfully accepted what God was asking of her and perhaps acting then in a way that only she could have done. 
Mary knew, uh, God knew Mary and God knew Mary's heart and chose her to be the one who would bear Christ to the world. Now, our ministry might look very different. For some of us, we're called to be ordained. Others are readers or in other licensed ministry. And yet others, equally importantly, as lay people, are offering their ministry to others through their baptism. I'm thinking of the meals and pastoral care and phone calls that so many people have been sharing in through this time of lockdown. Godly ministry that is precious and shared and valued by the people of God and for the people of God. As we worship God today, I invite you to pause at some point, now or later on today, and to reflect. To take a moment to think a little about how you've been serving God in the past, and to think about how and what that ministry might look like for the future. How could God use you for his work in the church and in the world? It has been the greatest joy and blessing to serve the church. I say this and I hope it doesn't sound like smugness, but every day I wake up knowing that what I will do that day is a true expression of God, what God wants me to do. And there's no other job that I should be doing. For others, your vocation and calling will be expressed in other jobs and roles. And yet for others, the responsibilities of family and the commitments of mortgages and finances make it hard to change tack at the moment. But that might not always be the case. So be alert to that in the future. I just feel so blessed by God. And I encourage you to consider how God could use you and your gifts, how you could be a blessing and serve him in all sorts of ways. The ministry I've been able to offer could only have looked like how it's looked like for me. And the same will be true of you and each and every one of us. But I do know this, when we don't go the way of easy options like Hananiah, when we struggle in prayer and for discernment like Jeremiah, when we do these things, we might actually discern what God is really asking of us in our lives and how we might prayerfully respond. And for each time we share in that, we are in our own way, in our own small way. We are tentatively, lovingly, willingly hastening the coming of God's kingdom. Let us profess together the faith of the Church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. 
we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our virtual choir sing the anthem, Jesu Joy of Man's Desiring, music by Johann Sebastian Bach. This morning I led for us by in, in the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ Jesus. Let us pray to our Heavenly Father. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you that you have brought us safely to the beginning of this day. Keep us from falling into sin or running into danger. Order us in all our doings and guide us to do always what is righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At this abnormal time of trial and uncertainty, with the coronavirus having such a devastating effect around the world, we ask you to help and strengthen your church in the service of Christ, supporting Archbishop Welby, Alan, our bishop, and in particular here in Redbourne, supporting Will, our vicar, his family, the ministry team, and all those who are lending their support in so many ways to St Mary's to ensure that we continue our mission and keep vibrant the loving and friendly community established here. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Heavenly Father, it is your wish that all nations should live together in harmony and understanding. We pray for those whose nations are subject to conflict and strife, especially in the Middle East and Africa, that peaceful solutions may be found, allowing desolated peoples to return to a safe way of life, able to confront the more common foes of want and ignorance, disease and sin. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear Lord, we pray for this beautiful natural world we inhabit, that we may hear the wake-up call to rescue our climate from the ravages wrought by global warming and misuse of the world's natural resources. In particular, we pray for the Diocese of Mpwapwa in Tanzania, the subject of our fundraising this year, that our efforts will help facilitate a significant improvement in the provision of fresh water and sustainable resources in the diocese. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer, Lord, for those people who are ill or who are feeling lonely or isolated, in hospital, at home, in nursing or care homes, or wherever they may be. Give them special courage, hope and peace, and the knowledge that you are present in their weakness and suffering. We remember particularly all those mentioned in the pew sheet and any others known to us who are currently suffering. And may the skill, knowledge and love of those who care for the sick be fully used to help, to heal and to comfort. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we pray for those whose hearts have been saddened by the death of someone close and dear to them, a sadness heightened by the inability at present to say a full and proper farewell. Give them that strong comfort which no one else can give, and let them know the comforting power of the resurrection of Jesus. We remember those who have recently died, and all those whose year's mind falls in the coming week. According to your promises, grant us with them a share in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, a prayer for ourselves. God our Father, by whose mercy the world turns safely into darkness and returns again to light, we place in your hands our unfinished tasks, our unsolved problems, and our unfulfilled hopes, knowing that only what you bless will prosper. To your love and protection we commit each other and all those we love, knowing that you alone are our sure defender. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. As our Saviour has taught us, so together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. 
Amen. May the God of peace make you perfect and holy, that you may be kept safe and blameless in spirit, soul and body for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Receive this sign of peace. We sing together the hymn, O Thou who camest from above. Show us your glory as far as we can grasp it, and shield us from knowing more than we can bear, until we may look upon you without fear, through Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. May the Father, from whom every family in earth and heaven receives its name, strengthen you with his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.